So today we're talking about assignment four in the class, and this is going to be the last official assignment. Um, but as you're going to see, um, now that we know what's in the project, which I've gone over, um, a lot of stuff in assignment four is actually going to be stuff that you need to implement for the project. So assignment four is not just some extra waste of time just to make your lives miserable. Like almost everything that you do in this assignment is going to be completely reused in the project. So you're basically working on the project for assignment four. Um, but before we start reading the spec, which is, it's rather long for this one, but that doesn't mean it's like more work than assignment three. I think assignment three and assignment four are probably around the same amount of work, especially since it's the exact same architecture, so you're not getting used to a new architecture. Um, it's just more text that I need to explain some things. So let's have a look at the solution. And I believe you may hear some sounds. So just like the last assignment, you're going to see this uh, screen pop up with some different levels that I have. Let me see if the sounds are playing. OK, so you can hear the sounds. In your assignment, I actually want there to be like background music. So there's music on the menu and music in the game. Uh, but that gets a little annoying when we're actually trying to learn about the assignment. So I just disabled the music in the solution so that we're not listening to the Legend of Zelda theme song for an hour and 10 minutes. So that's why there's no music here. So this, as you can see, is a bit of a clone of the Legend of Zelda for the NES. Um, first and foremost, the biggest change to this assignment is the fact that there are now some NPCs with some very, very basic AI in this assignment. So that's, I'd say, the biggest change. Not necessarily the hardest change, um, but the biggest one, I think, from a gameplay perspective. So as you can see here, um, we have this sort of fixed camera perspective um, of Link walking around. So Link can walk around uh, W, A, S, and D, up, down, left, and right. Uh, if I hold two of those keys at the same time, left and right, I am not moving uh, at all. And if I hold up and down, I'm not moving at all. If I hold two diagonals, um, I've basically just got to assign priority to one of the directions. So you're not allowed to move in a, in a diagonal. That's one little thing that you have to figure out. Um, there is hit points and damage in this. So for example, if I come down here, oh, I guess I should show you. If I attack, a sound plays. So there are sounds in this assignment. Um, I've included all the sounds for you. And basically, you just call like assets.getsound.play. That, that's it. It's really, really easy to use sounds in SFML. And so when I hit the space bar, a little sword comes out, depending on the way that I'm facing. And that has a certain duration. And so you're going to have to figure out how you will do that. And then if a sword um, interacts with an NPC, or it uh, collides with an NPC, there is a different sound that plays and some amount of damage will be dealt to that NPC. And you can see here, uh, it may be difficult to see in the actual classroom because it's a little bit small, but this NPC has like eight health, and as I hit it, it deals one damage. And there's a little health bar above the NPC, and uh, when I deal the last hit point of damage, it reuses that uh, explosion animation from the last one. Uh, as I walk around, so if I get to the side of this level, oh look, there's another part of the level. Okay, so there are different parts to this level, and the levels are organized into rooms. So that's what I'm calling them. You could call them whatever you want, but I'm calling them rooms. So this is one room. This is another room. If I walk up here, this is another room. And there's some NPCs up there. Um, oh, he's chasing me now. Uh, this is another room down here. And this is another room over here. And so those are the four rooms that I have. If you go down to any other room, there's just nothing there. I got sick and tired of making content for the assignment. Let me, uh, oh, this guy is going to deal two points of damage to me, but then I have some invincibility frames where I am actually invulnerable to damage after a little bit, and they're going to hit me again. And so I've died, and I've gone back to the middle, but oh, here they are chasing me to another room. So there's some differences from normal Zelda. We're not like only spawning enemies if we're in that room. All of these enemies are always active at all times. Um, some of the blocks within a level, if I toggle, I've got, some, uh, I've got a menu up here. And so I can draw the debug stuff. So here's some debug stuff. What is this? Actually, I'll get into the debug stuff in a second. Uh, but pretty much everything in this assignment, oh, here he comes. All right, I killed him real quick. Everything in this assignment works off of a grid 
um, except for the actual positions of the NPCs that I've given. So here we can see that uh, I've conveniently organized this assignment so all the tiles, all the animations are basically one of these grid cells in size. And so what will happen um, in, the, in the level file, which we'll see, is that everything in the environment, everything in the world, is given two coordinates. One is the room x and y coordinate, and the other is the grid x and y coordinate. And so what we have is this. Um, so it just so happens that up here is coordinate 0, 0 in the world space. And so this is room 0, 0. The one above it is room 0, negative 1. The one to the left is room negative 1, 0. We'll talk about that a bit more um, in a bit, but that's how the levels file, file is specified with this grid. And if I come down here, um, you can see that here uh, the grid tiles are actually coming down into like, OK, this says 0 or 4, 14. Down here, it's like 28. So I haven't labeled the grid with its actual like room and grid tiles. I've just drawn the grid and given it labels in x and y. So if I were to place, even though this one says here, um, oh, Jesus, there's stuff coming after me. All right. So even, <laughs> even though this one up here says uh, 113, for example, that's with respect to the actual 0, 0 coordinate in the world. But if I were to specify this um, in the level file, it would be room. OK, I'm one room down. So it's room 0, 1, tile 1, 1. OK, so that's what that one is actually specified. And the reason I don't do that is because if I did show you the room and tile coordinate, I'd be doing all the math for you. And you wouldn't want me to give you the solution, right? So I've done the grid just to make it a little bit easier for the assignment, but I haven't done all of the calculations for the rooms and for the tiles. OK. Um, and also, like if I get hit here um, by this NPC, and then I come up and I collect a heart, I go back to full health. And then if I come up here, um, the NPCs can actually take the, the health as well. And it actually does refill their health. Oh my god, he's so fast. OK. So the NPC behavior, do, do I have a restart key in this? No, I don't. OK, so let me um, restart everything. There are two types of NPC behavior in this game. Uh, and let me look at the debug information to show you that NPC behavior. Uh, I can't remember the hockey yet. C, or I can click over here. So what you see here, um, there are some lines coming out of Link. There are some boxes surrounding all the things. And those boxes have colors associated with what they do. And so in this um, assignment, tiles have uh, several different properties on them. So tiles can either block movement, meaning if I walk into them, they block my movement, or they can block NPC vision, or both, or none. Okay? So every tile on it, oh jeez, why don't you tell me anything? Come on. Okay. So every tile in the game has two booleans. Does it block vision and does it block movement? Okay? And so we just set those at the time that we make the tile. So blocking movement is pretty obvious, but what does blocking vision mean? Well, if I, now I have to restart this again. If it blocks vision, um, one type of NPC behavior is called follow behavior. And that NPC behavior follows the player if there is a line of sight between the center of the NPC and the center of the player. So every NPC that has a follow behavior, I've just drawn a line between Link and that NPC. So this NPC here, for example, has a follow behavior indicated by me drawing this line, but this tree blocks vision. And so since it blocks vision, this NPC cannot see me, indicated by the fact that this line is being intersected. Um, it intersects with this entity. The way we are going to do entity intersections, we have a, f a function in our physics class or our physics namespace, which is uh, entity intersect. And the way you do entity intersection is you take the line between the player and the NPC. And if that line intersects with any of the four lines um, caused by the outline of the animation of that uh, entity, then it is blocked. 
Okay, so here we can see that it is blocked, but as I move up, and as soon as this line no longer intersects, boom, now it's following me. Okay, so that's what we have to do. That's one follow behavior. As I can see up here, I get the health. As I move up, all of these have a follow behavior, but these are blocking vision. So as soon as I come over here, this one starts to follow me as well. Okay, so there's no, there's no pathfinding going on here. It just tries to move in a completely straight line. Question? Uh, can they be totally outside of the screen? Yes, yeah. So they can follow me from anywhere in the world. Um, that is just something I did not want to. Uh, well, there we go. That answers your question. So this one came from over here. Yeah, so this one right here, um, these, this water blocks movement, but not vision. And so it's like a lake, right? Like I can't walk over the lake, but they can see me over the lake. So the whole time he was trying to get to me until I like moved up far enough that he could actually see me. And so the entities are active at all times, blocking vision, blocking movement, etc. So it's not the exact same as Zelda, but that's all you can do. Okay, so that's the main like functionality of the assignment. Now I'm going to go over the whole text file and uh, do a minimal, I'm not going to do any like live coding. Uh, and I'm going to actually look at the code inside VS Code because it's just, I've found it a little bit nicer for actually just looking at text in the environment of this actual projection. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to be looking at everything in VS Code, but obviously you're going to do the assignment in, in Visual Studio. So I don't need to, uh, to look at any of this stuff. We know what that is. So program specification, let's get right down to it. So in this assignment, you'll be working on writing the game that I just presented. It must have the following features. Um, these are all, the assets are all the same uh, as assignment three. So entities in the game will be rendered using various textures and animations, which we will be calling assets, along with fonts and sounds. So we have sound assets this time on top of just textures. Assets are loaded once at the beginning of the program and stored in the assets class, which is stored in the game engine class. And all of the assets are defined in assets.txt with the syntax, which well, I will get to later um, on in the lecture. But the player. So the player is very different this time. Um, the player entity in the game is represented by not link for legal reasons, um, which has several different animations. Run down, run up, run right, stand down, stand up, stand right, attack up, attack down, and attack right. You must determine which direction and state the player is currently in and assign the correct animation. Um, the player is assigned the following animations in the direction facing. Please note that left will be accomplished by mirroring right. And so in the assignment, uh, let me just go, actually let me read this and then I'll go back to the assignment. Um, stand dir, which means stand up, down, or right. Um, when no input or both opposite is being given to the player. So stand is being given when you're not doing anything at all. Uh, run is being given when you are actually moving in that direction. And attack is being given when the sword is currently visible from an attack. So, um, and the, the player moves with the following W, A, S, and D, and space for attack. The player can move up, down, left, and right at any time during the game. But the player can only move either horizontally or horizontally or vertically at a time. Um, so let's go back to the game and look at what that means. So if I'm in the actual game, here we go. So right now I am in the stand down animation. So if I went to all the, the animation files, I would see there's an enemy collecting a, an item somewhere. I, I actually don't know what that is. But he's standing down. And so that's one of the animations that's loaded. This is stand right. That's another of the animations. This is stand up. So you can see that stand right and stand left are just mirror images of each other. So if you want to have left playing, there's only a right animation. We don't want to duplicate assets if we don't have to. So if you set the scale of this, of, of this entity to negative 1, then it will flip. Right? So the, the, sorry, the X scale will flip. However, you might say, well, why don't we just have down flip to get up? Well, it's because it's a completely different animation. We're seeing the front of Link versus the back of Link. So Link is symmetric horizontally, but not vertically. Okay? Um, maybe if the sword was visible 
on link, it wouldn't be uh, symmetric left and right because you know I've got my shield in this hand, sword in this hand. So if I'm like this, I'd have the sword over here. If I was like this, I'd have the sword over here. But conveniently, the sword is not visible. All right. Then there's an attack animation where Link kind of puts the foot out the back. So you've got to both spawn the sword and play the foot out. Now, the attack animation, which we'll get to in a bit, you're just going to spawn a sword. So this, has, this is just a separate entity that has a lifespan. Right? So you spawn a sword, which has a lifespan, and you pick some distance from Link in that particular direction um, to spawn the sword that makes sense. So for example, maybe you spawn it, I don't know, one tile over or almost a tile over. You have to say, OK, which direction is Link facing? Figure that out, and then spawn the sword in that direction. And then the sword, you'll figure out if the sword is colliding with um, entities and then take away hit points if that happens. So that's what the the player does and the player animation system. I'll just leave that open while I go back, so I don't need to keep starting that up. OK, if uh, opposite directions are held, the player will be given a standing animation. So you can't, you're not moving uh, if, you're, if you have uh, both directions held, both opposite directions. The player can only attack once its current attack animation has finished. So what this means is twofold. Um, I can't. I'm actually pressing the space bar about twice as fast as the attack. So the attack has to finish before I can spawn another sword. So you have to figure that out somehow. And if I hold down the space bar, I am not continuously attacking. So you have to do that as well. And the easy way to do that is in the, um, the player, there's a Boolean which is like can shoot. And so if you have it, just like, a, that was in assignment three as well, right? OK, so you, so you know how to do that. Uh, the player collides with tile entities in the level whose bounding box, box blocks movement and cannot th uh, go through them. So you check the entity's bounding box. If the bounding box says blocks movement, then you cannot move through those. And so that collision system, you can, you can literally copy and paste the uh, bounding box collisions from assignment three if you got them to work properly, and they will work properly for assignment four. So all of the same collision checks should still work. Um, the player will be given a bounding box of a size specified in the level file. So just like Mega Man, uh, Link's bounding box may not be the same size as the animation. The player will be given a health component with a max health that is specified in the level file. So we'll go over that. But as you can see here, um, Link's health is currently three. So there are three little dashes above Link. I believe that I've actually given you the rendering code for um, the health bars. So you don't have to do the rendering of the health bars. I've given that to you. When the player's current health is less than or equal to zero, the player responds, and the link, uh, link die sound should play. And the place that it responds is wherever the initial position was in the, um, in the level file. The player, if the player has an invincibility component, it takes no damage from enemies, and its sprite is made transparent. The duration of the component is reduced each frame, and when the duration reaches zero, the component is removed, making it vulnerable to attacks again. So the way this works, if we can see this here, it's, uh, it's pretty short, but you'll see when I get hit, Link is going to become transparent. And now, if I didn't have invincibility frames, this is running at 60 frames per second, right? So what happens is, if I'm inside, and if I'm colliding with an en another enemy entity, then 60 times per second, I would be taking damage, which would be pretty unfair, right? So I think maybe it's like a second, so I get hit here, Link turns, yeah, so it's for a second. So what happens is, when you get hit, you attach an invincibility component, and then you subtract one each frame. When it gets to zero, you remove the invincibility component. And that's a really good way to do any sort of status effect. If you're poisoned, if you're invincible, if you have a Mario star that kills things, um, your status like lives for some amount of time, and then it gets removed. And so what you have to do when you collide with an entity to take damage, of course, now you have to check, do I actually have an invincibility component? And if I do have an invincibility component, then I don't need to check, uh, sorry, I don't take damage from that collision. Uh, when the player collides with an enemy while not invincible, first, the player's current health is reduced by the enemy damage component. 
So enemies have a damage component. So I got hit by this one, and I took one damage. But if I get hit by this one, uh, the knight is a bit stronger, and I take two damage, right? So the enemies each have a damage component. And that's about it for the player. Other entities. Um, each tile and NPC in the game specifies two Boolean values of whether it blocks movement and whether it blocks vision. If a tile blocks movement, the player collides with it and cannot pass through. Actually, all entities collide with it and cannot pass through. So all NPCs and all players. If an entity blocks vision, then it affects enemy line of sight, and we'll see that when we get to the AI section in a bit. So the bounding box component has two new booleans to reflect um, those things. The last thing, which I actually haven't shown yet because I forgot about it, is when the player steps onto a tile with the black animation, then they are telep uh, teleported to a random black tile on the map. What does that mean? Well, up here, this is a black tile. So if I walk into it, I get teleported to another random one. Um, Uh-oh, I'm trapped in here. Oh, wait, I can actually escape, right? So in here, if I turn off textures and I turn, off, uh, I turn on the collision thing, you can see this one is red. This one is black. So black means, or. <laughs> all right, hang on. Uh. All right, so um, the way I've colored these things is that if it's black, it blocks movement and vision. If it's red, it blocks vision but not movement. If it's blue, it blocks movement but not vision. And if it's white, it blocks neither. Okay, so if I turn back on textures, then if I come in here, uh, I will teleport to a random black one, which could be I'm not doing the check, um, and you don't have to do the check because I didn't have to, I didn't do the check, but I'm not checking to see if it's the same one. But it does teleport to a random one. So if I just hold up, you'll see this funny, you know, teleporting around the map. But that's just a little fun thing um, that I threw in there. Okay, oh, there's an enemy coming for me. Um, okay, attacking. When the player attacks, a sword appears for 10 frames and then disappears. Let me restart. OK, I'll restart when I have to. When the player attacks, a sword appears for 10 frames and then disappears approximately one tile away from the player in the direction that they are facing. The, sword, the player's sword should be given a bounding box equal to the animation size. When the sword when the sword collides with an enemy, it deals its damage component worth of damage to the health of an enemy that it collides with. The sword should only do damage for one frame, and then its damage component should be removed so that it does not deal damage for every frame that it overlaps. Right? Because just like the player walking into the entity, if I attack with the sword, then what will happen? Well, if it's active for 10 frames, it will deal damage 10 times to the enemy. So the damage component of the sword is removed once it has dealt damage to an enemy. Now, if you're making an actual game, maybe you would want it to be able to deal damage to multiple enemies in one swing. And so that may not work. Or what you could do is you could loop over all the entities, deal the damage, and then after the loop, if anything was hit, now you remove the damage component. Right? So you could either do it where you loop through the entities, uh, if it collides with one of them, then you deal the damage and remove the component and break. Or you could have it so that it deals the damage to all the entities that it has hit on this frame, and then the damage component gets removed. So it's up to you which one you do, uh, whichever, whichever one. Um, but I will tell you that it is kind of cool that if you let it deal damage to multiple entities, let me see if I can actually get this to work. Okay, so I'll go over here. Um, so this is kind of interesting. The reason this is happening is because these entities block vision, but not movement. So this guy is trying to follow me, but he can only follow me when the vision isn't blocked. So this is sort of a dynamic vision sort of thing. So I, I just thought that was an interesting example to throw in there. So let's, um, let's move over here. I don't know if I can actually accomplish this. Hang on. What I'm trying to do is activate the sword and turn around, and you can do that. So there we go. So I attacked in one direction, but the sword, if I switch, 
the sword should be where I'm facing, right? So with an actual sword in real life, I can swing it and then turn. And so I would like that to be also in this game. Now, I'm not sure if it will actually damage in both directions. Let me see if I can somehow pull. Oh, oh. Come on. Line up. Please don't kill me. Oh, whatever. Okay. You see what I'm trying to accomplish, but I can't, I can't get it to work here. When the sword is swung, the slash sound should play. When the sword collides with an enemy, the enemy hit sound should play. When an enemy's health is reduced to zero, it is destroyed. When an enemy is destroyed, the enemy die sound should play. So all of those things are all already loaded for you. NPC entities. So this is completely new for this assignment. NPCs will be given an quote-unquote AI behavior. I guess it is technically game AI, but it's not very intelligent. It is either a follow behavior or a patrol behavior. Follow means it will follow the player when the player is in direct line of sight or head back to its original position when not in line of sight. When an entity is at its home position, it should not oscillate. What does this mean? Well, I've got to restart it again to get this guy up. So here, with this entity at its home position, it's, it's constantly walking back to its home position. So if I go up here and then I go back, it moves back to its home position. But if you don't do something that says, hey, if it's not within a few pixels or, if, or like, a, like a certain amount of distance from its home position, then completely stop its movement, what will happen is it'll move back. And like if it's moving at three speed, it will like go three pixels past and then three pixels past and then three pixels past and it'll like oscillate back and forth. Um, so that's not what we want. So make sure that it doesn't oscillate. And then the second behavior is a patrol behavior, which you can see here. And uh, these patrol NPCs essentially have a vector of points in the map that they move toward. And so once you get to one patrol point, you go to the next one, then the next one, then the next one. And when you've reached the last one, you go back to the original one. And so you can see down here, there's one with just two patrol points. This one has four patrol points, so it's moving in a square. And so that's the second type of behavior that we have. So the second one, patrol, means it will move toward a series of patrol positions, looping back around to the start when the final one is reached. An NPC has reached its patrol position if it is within a distance of five from it. So that's what I did in my solution. So if the distance between the, the center of the entity and the patrol position is less than five, we consider it reached, and then we go to the next one. If you're trying to get it to match exactly on the exact pixel, then of course that won't happen. Now this distance of five, that only works if the entity has a speed less than five, right? If my entity was moving at like 10 speed, then it may overshoot and then it'll never actually come you know, within that amount of distance. So that, if you're making a real game, this amount of distance that you have, which, um, which you are within a patrol point, should probably actually be dependent on the speed of the entity. So we may say, what's the speed of the entity? If my distance is less than what it should travel in one frame, then I would do that. But this is easy enough for this assignment. Tiles. Tiles are very uh, similar to assignment three. So tiles are entities that define the level geometry and interact with players. Tiles can be given any animation that is defined in the assets file. They will be given a bounding box equal to the size of the animation. So tile get component C animation um, dot animation dot get size. The current animation displayed for a tile can be retrieved with this. So that's uh, the same as assignment three. And if the tile has a heart animation, any NPC or player that collides with it should have its health refilled to the maximum, and then the heart tile is destroyed. So the heart can be collided by both the player and the NPCs. Uh, the rendering is basically done for you um, for, for this game. And so the game window is given a fixed size of 1280 by 768 pixels. And 768, no, it is not a strict 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And the reason for that is because um, 1280 by 720 is not the, the height 720 is not divisible by 64, which is our tile size. And so I've just given it a, a close enough size of 20 by 12 tiles. Okay? So that's, that's why the size is given. So we have a size of 20 by 12 tiles. Rending, rendering of entities is provided for you, as well as a debug rendering mode, which can be toggled with the F key. That is actually the C key, so ignore this. Um, and the R key toggles. OK, I don't know why it's saying that. T toggles textures and C toggles this. 
but it's also here in the debug menu. So I've got a typo there. The assignments are already released, so I'm not, I'm not redoing all of that just to fix that one typo. So you'll have to live with that. Um, you are required to change the camera position window.view of the game window to alternate between two modes based on the mFollow variable. Uh, if the mFollow variable is true, then it is in follow mode, where the camera is always centered on link. And if it is false, then it is centered on room mode, so the camera is always centered on the middle of the room that link is in. So what does this mean? Um, so follow mode is up here. I can toggle that, or I can press the Y key. If I press the Y, so this is the default camera room view. And then if I press the Y key, this is the follow cam. And you can see how weird Zelda looks when you're using the follow cam, right? Like it's like completely different game. So there's a, cam oh, there's a camera system. Let's make this guy go home. OK, well, let's just stand here for a bit. OK. There we go. So it, it looks much different, right? This is how it's, uh, I think, is supposed to look because it's actual Legend of Zelda type camera. But this is your practice of using cameras because you've got to have a couple different camera views for the project. So you're going to have to figure out um, the geometry or the mathematics behind figuring out the camera for the room. The, the Follow view is by far the easiest. You literally just set the view to be centered on link, and then that's it. You're done. So the rooms. Each level is split up, split up into individual rooms, given a, a room x and a room y coordinate. Each room, rx, ry, is defined by the rectangle rx times w, ry times h, and then width, height, where w and h are the window, width, and height, respectively. So a room is defined by the top left corner um, given by this formula. So if it's room 0, 0, then the top left starts at 0, 0, and it has width and height. If it's room 0, 1, then this would be 0, and then height is where it would start in the Y, and then width and height. Um, each tile is given a tile X and tile Y grid position within a room. By default, the grid cells and all tiles have 64 by 64 pixel uh, dimensions. And when not link moves to a new room, the camera should center to that room. And so what your job is, is based on link's position, figure out what room he is supposed to be in. So here, for example, you may just take the x and y position of link and do integer division with the room width and height and then those will both be zero, so maybe you're in room zero, zero. Right? So that's a, a hint at, at what should be done. OK. The GUI. Uh, you must implement the animations and entity manager tabs in IM GUI so that they have the same functionality as the solution. So here, if I pull up the, the IM GUI thing, uh, what do I have here? I know this is impossibly small for you, those of you in the room. But here I have the ability to turn off the debugging things, the ability to turn on or off the follow camera. Then I have a sounds menu where you can play or stop all the different sounds. So this is why I did not have this active for the <laughs> entirety of the, uh, the lecture. So this is just my little UI. You don't have to make this uh, part of the interface. I've just included it uh, to show you that it's really easy to do. There's an animations part of the assignment. And all you have to do is go through all of the animations that are defined in the text file or in the assets file. So it's just assets.getAnimations. You're given a list of all the animations. And then you make an IM GUI textured button. So these are buttons. And if I click on it, then maybe for my level editor, I would actually spawn that entity and then be able to place it in the map. So you're not making a full level editor for this assignment, obviously. But by the time you actually get to the project, you'll have a good part of the level editor done because you're actually doing this part. And that's like, that's like eight lines of code. It's really not that bad. And then the entity manager part, which you've seen before, is listing all the entities in the game. So for example, all the tiles, um, all the swords. So there's only ever going to be one sword at a time. Um, all the players, all the NPCs. Um, and it's cool in here. I've done it so you can actually see the animation of the NPC. That's actually probably easier to do than not seeing the animation of the NPC. But it's just um, the, 
the texture or animation of the NPC, the NPC's unique uh, ID, uh, the type of this entity, the uh, name of the animation being played, and then the uh, position of the entity currently in the world. So that's what you have to do. Um, it doesn't have to look exactly like this. These are collapsible headers, I believe, like I am GUI collapsible header. Um, and then within that collapsible header, you can do something. Um, so however you get that to work is fine. I don't, I don't really care either way. But as long as it has the same functionality. So you have to do that part, animations and entity manager. Um, then I give you the controls. These are the actual controls, uh, not the incorrect controls that I listed above. So for everything in the game, here's the, uh, uh, there's a pause key, uh, debug view, texture rendering, et cetera, et cetera, or you can use the debug menu that I've given you. There will be two configuration files in the assignment, the assets, assets config file and the level config file. The assets file is um, exactly the same as assignment three, so I'm not going to go into detail for that one, except we also have sound assets. Okay, so however you would have accessed a texture um, asset before, now it's just a sound asset. And I've specified that um, in, the texture, in the assets file. So let's just have a quick look at the assets file over here in bin assets. So I'll close this. We've got the textures, the animations, just like assignment three. And here we've got sounds. So we've got slash, and then I've just got a sounds directory where I have them all stored as wave files. So um, the sounds are wave files. The um, music files, they're still just sound files, but SFML either accepts WAVE or OGG. Uh, the reason these are not MP3 is because that's a proprietary format and SFML is an open source library. So um, they're not including the MPEG decoder library in this. So OGG is just an open source sound format. So those are the sounds. Um, where am I going now? Yes, OK. So I actually haven't specified that you need to play music yet, have I? I didn't say that in the text file. So if I didn't say it in the text file, you don't have to do it. But if you want to, you can. It might be annoying if every time you launch the program you're listening to the music, um, but that's fine. OK, now we've got a level specification file. And just like assignment three, we've got this level specification. However, uh, so in this assignment, just remember that 00, zero is in the top left. Um, and width height is in the bottom right. So here we've got the player specification. So the player is specified by X, Y, B, X, B, Y, S, H. So X and Y are the spawn position, X and Y. Um, I believe that is actually in pixel coordinates. Let me just see if that is true. Uh, level one, players at the bottom. Yeah, so the player's spawn position are, is actually in pixel coordinates. That is the only thing that's given in pixel coordinates. Everything else is given in tile coordinates. Then BX, BY, that is the bounding box size. Of course, the bounding box size is also in pixel coordinates. Um, then the speed at which the player moves, and then the maximum health of the player. So if I you know, change that 3 to an 8, then the player should have 8 health. Next, we've got a tile specification. Tile comes in the form of RX, RY, TX, TY, BM, BV. Um, oh, sorry, there was name before that as well. So name, that is the animation that's play, being played for the tile. That is the string. Then we've got the room X and Y coordinate in integers. Then the tile X and Y coordinate in integers. And then um, whether it blocks movement and whether it blocks vision. And it'll be a 1 if it's true and a 0 if it's false. And so I got a little diagram here that I tried to make up. Um, so this is a view. Can I full screen this? Yes. So this is a diagram of the rooms that I have included in the game. And this is really pretty janky. I just like took screenshots and sort of aligned them. Um, so here in the actual game, this right here is the top left of the middle room. That is world coordinate 00. zero. So Link is going to spawn in 640, 480, right here, um, which is in the middle of, approximately the middle of the um, middle room. Here you can see that what I've told you before is that if you essentially, to figure out the room X and Y coordinate, you can just use integer division 
with length's coordinate. So take the position of length, the x coordinate, divide it by the size of a room, which is the width, and then take the y coordinate, divide it by the height of a room, and then you've basically got the x and the y coordinate of length. So in the middle here, this would be room 0, 0. This would be room negative 1, 0. This would be room 0, negative 1. This would be room 0, 1. And this would be room 1, 0. So if something said 1, 0, 10, 10, that means room 1, 0, which is right here. And then 10, 10 is approximately right here somewhere. So that is the coordinate that you're going to have to figure out. And I don't think that math is entirely too difficult. OK, uh, next we've got the NPC specification, which is probably the, the most complex of all the specifications. So we've got name, room x, room y, tile x, tile y, block movement, block vision, max health, damage, and then some AI parameters. OK, so room x, room y, tile x, tile y, block movement, block vision, health, and damage. Those should all be pretty obvious, right? You, you load those into the NPC. The only new one is damage. And if the NPC collides with the player, that's how much damage it deals to the player. And then you've got this variable length AI string, which can go on for a little bit. So we're going to get into what that means in a second. So if the AI is the follow behavior, then the only thing that appears is the speed that it is going to follow the, the player. That's it. So if this is a follow behavior, then you would just have like five there, which is the speed that it should follow at. If it's a patrol behavior, however, it's got a number of things. So it's got S, which is the speed, then N, which is the number of patrol positions you're about to read in, and then you've got two N integers, which are the x and y positions of the n patrol positions. Okay, So xi, x1, y1 comes first, then x2, y2. So this is the first patrol position, then the second patrol position, and then going up to the nth patrol position. So for example, if you had this line right here, that would be spawn an NPC with animation name tektite in room 00, zero so that's room x and y right here, with tile position 1510, the NPC um, doesn't block movement or vision. Those are those two. It has a maximum health of 2 and a damage of 1. And then it's going to say patrol. So the next thing you have to read in is this patrol. And it's going to have a speed of 2 with four positions, which are um, in the same room. OK, so patrol positions don't have a room X and a room Y. They just have tile X and tile Y. So all the patrolling has to be within the same room. And the patrol positions are uh, X, Y, 15, 10, 15, 7, 17, 7, and 17, 10. And so you're going to have to do a little bit more complicated file reading in order to get, those, um, to get that uh, reading properly. But because I've given you the number of patrol positions, then that should be pretty easy to do, I think. You just read in that value of n, and then you loop from 0 to 2n, read in all these things, and those are the patrol positions. And then in the patrol component, there'll be a vector in which you can store those patrol positions. So every time you read in an x and y, you just push those x and y as a vec2 into the patrol positions. Miscellaneous notes. OK. Uh, this will come into play when I look over the code in a second. But one big change to the coding. I've made a couple of changes to the coding versus assignment three. The architecture has stayed exactly the same. Okay? But the coding has changed a little bit. The first is that the m player variable has been removed. There's no more player variable. In order to get access to the player, now you're, I've, I've included a player function. So you call the player function. And what the player does is it looks in the entity manager for a player and returns it. And so essentially what it does is it asks the entity manager, hey, do we have anything that's a player? If we don't, then we can actually like throw an error and say, hey, we don't have a player. That's weird. But before, if there was no player, we just had a variable that we were accessing that we assumed to be true, which is kind of bad practice. What if that player died and we forgot to respawn it? Well, now we have a programming error, right? So this is slightly less efficient, because we have to use the entity manager each time. 
but it allows us to put in sanity checks for things like checking to see if a player object exists before using it, et cetera. And uh, it's, I think it's just a good change overall. It's just instead of calling m underscore player, now you call the player function. Second, a bit of a quality of life change um, is that in the entity class, wherever we had has component, get component, add component, or remove component, I've just removed the word component from each of those. So it's less typing. So now to add, so in order to do um, get component C transform is now just E get C transform. Okay, so everyone I'm sure after doing assignment three is wishing I had done it for assignment three, but here we go, better late than never, right? Um, and just a quick note about the implementation of sounds. Um, so the SF sound objects, so what you do in order to play a sound in SFML, you create an SF sound object and you give it a file name. That's it. And then you can say sound.play. And so they can be played with the dot .play uh, function and stopped with dot .stop. However, in order to play properly, the sound object must persist for at least the duration of the sound that you want to be played. What does that mean? What it means is if you simply allocate a local sound object and then call sound.play, it will stop playing as soon as the sound object goes out of scope. Right? So if you have a function that you call, called play sound, and you just said SF sound, here's my file name, and then you click dot play, well, right after that dot play, your function is going to exit, clean up all the local variables, and then the sound is destroyed. And so you've played it for a billionth of a second and then stopped. So what I've done for you to make this a little bit easier is that inside the assets class, I have a vector or a map of all the sounds. And so those sounds are in a place where they will persist for the lifetime of the, the, the project. So you can say assets.getSound. This returns a reference to a persistent sound that you can just call dot .play on. However, the only limiting thing that this does is that calling dot .play on a sound object that is already playing will just restart the sound instead of playing another copy of it. So for example, if we have link, uh, or if we have an enemy die, and let's say the enemy dying sound is some five second, uh, something like that, if we had two enemies die within the same second, it would be like, uh, uh, like it would restart the playing of it. So we don't have the ability in this way to actually, like what I've done for this assignment, we don't have the ability to play multiple copies overlapping of the same sound because it's the same sound object that we're trying to play twice. But if you did want to do something like this, then what you could do really simply is just maybe have a vector of all the sounds that you currently want to be playing, detect if the sound is over, and then remove them from the vector so you could add new things to it. You can think of how you may do that if that's something that you want to do for the project. But I've just given you the easiest way to accomplish something good enough, and then later on you can make that better if you want to. So um, some assignment hints here. Um, you can use all of your collision code from assignment three uh, in this assignment. And I recommend approaching the assignment in the following order. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over all of these things in order, and I'll show you where in the code that thing lives. And so we'll just go back and forth between the text file and the code file. And I actually, in order to do this, I think I may want to open up a second window with the readme in it, because it'll be easier to tab back and forth than it will to actually switch back and forth in the thing. So let's go down here to where we were. OK. So first implement the GUI whenever you feel like you'd like to have it for debugging. So the user interface does not rely on anything else because the assets are already loaded and the entity manager already exists. So you can do it the very first thing if you want to or you can do it the last thing if you want to. So let's actually go over and run what I've given you by default. So by default, what you get is this. Okay, so it plays at the menu screen, but this is all you get. There's no up, down, left, and right. Uh, I've just created an entity to show you how to create an entity. I've given it some health here and a maximum health. I've hard-coded that. Up here, you do have access to the debug menu, so you can do that. Um, the follow cam doesn't do anything right now, but all that is there. And then over in animations, it says do this, 
and over in Entity Manager, it says do this too. Okay. So if we go look at the code where that is, so let me. Uh, so you're only editing two files in this assignment, I think. One is the physics file, where you'll be. So over in physics, um, here you're doing like this is the get overlap and previous overlap that you can copy and paste from assignment three. Then we just have is inside, which says is a point inside an entity. Then we have line intersect, which is straight from the notes, copy and paste it from the notes and turn it into C++, which takes line segment AB and line segment CD and returns um, whether or not they are intersecting and where. And then we have entity intersect, which takes in uh, a line segment AB and an entity. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that entity's bounding box you're going to figure out the four lines that form the bounding box. So the top left, the top right, the bottom left, and the bottom right, those are four line segments. Then for each of those four line segments, you call does line intersect with A, B, and uh, the, each of the four line segments of that. So that's what that is. So that's just the physics class. And then the other class that we have is scene Zelda. So it used to be scene play, now it's scene Zelda. So it says to implement the GUI whenever you want. Down here, I've implemented a sample GUI skeleton code. And so you all know what this is by now because you've seen I am GUI. But I've just given you uh, the debug here, which allows you to toggle on or off the collisions. And then I've given you the tabs for animations and entity manager. And then you just fill in those things with the UI. Next, uh, implement the WASD movement for the player so that it moves up, down, left, and right whenever those keys are pressed. Uh, this will allow you to test rectangular collisions as soon as possible. So I, I do recommend, even before you've loaded the level, just get Link moving around. So where would you do that? That involves two parts. So the first part is here in the init. So you first have to um, register the actions for moving up, down, left, and right. So you can just take this, copy and paste it, and say, OK, A is moving left, S is moving down, D is moving right. So you did this for assignment three, right? I'm not crazy. OK. So you had to register uh, actions there. Then once they are registered, you come down to the do action, and you implement the start and the end parts. Uh, so if the button is clicked or if the button is released. And what you're doing there is, of course, you are looking in the components.h, and you have the input here. So when you press. Uh, when the left part, uh, sorry, when a left action is inputted, then you get the player's C input component, and you set left equal to true. If down is pressed, you set it to true, and then for the end portion, you set them to false, right? And then we have an attack part of that as well. So what you do then is um, up in the movement system. Where is that? We got do, 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 do. movement. In here, you will read um, the input component of the player, and then if its like input component of left is true, then you will set its speed, etc. So that should be pretty obvious because we've done a very similar thing in assignment three. Next thing to do that so that is the movement of the player, and a bunch of people asked me, and I saw some people's code for assignment three. Um, Things like, OK, if you're holding left, move to the left. So you'd set the player's velocity to like negative 5, right? If, if you were moving to the left and the speed was 5. And so some people had, if left is held, do this. If up is held, do this. Or uh, there was actually an else if, right? So else if this, else if that. And then they had a special case for if left is held and right is held, right? But what I recommend is just say something like, if left is held, subtract 5. If right is held, add 5. And then it'll be 0 if both of them are held. right? So you don't need an else if of every possible holding of button combinations. The only thing you do need to probably else if is that you have to choose if up and right are held, which of up or right do you actually want to be active. Okay? Maybe it was the last one that was pressed. Maybe you're always going to choose horizontal movement or always choose vertical movement. Whichever one you do is fine with me. Just implement the movement properly. Next is to implement gameplay, uh, or sorry, this is game state Zelda, 
What? This is scene Zelda. Ah, I remember. Scenes used to be called game states when I first created the class. Um, and now it's called, they're called scenes. So game state play is actually scene Zelda. So maybe I will go back and fix some of these typos. But load level is only in one place in the entire assignment, so hopefully you know where to put that. This will allow you to load the assets for the level um, given to you and test the rest of the assignment. To do this, you will need to implement get position. So first, let's have a look at load level. So load level is up here, uh, right here. So you create the entity manager that resets the entity manager so you don't have any leftover things if you're calling this again. Load the level file and put all of the entities into the entity manager and then use the get position function below to convert from room tile coordinates to game world coordinates. And then you will call spawn player here. So get position is the function which takes in a room x and a room y and a tile x and a tile y and returns the center of the entity. Okay, so here, for example, in the game, if I look at this entity right here, there's this dot where this, where this entity is. And that, of course, we're using the center of each entity as its position. So if I said room 00, zero tile 16, 6, this is the position that you will be returning in that function. Okay? And it's, it's, OK, I'll just tell you the code. It's room x times width in the x plus tile x times 64 plus 32. Right? It's like it's really easy because it's, it's, it's just the, how, how far do we go over for the room coordinate? How far do we go over for the tile coordinate? And then we add, have to add half of a tile in order to put it in the middle. Right? And for the y, it's how far do we have to go down for the room height? How far do we have to go down for the tile height? And then another 32 for the center of that. So that's, that's pretty easy. Um, OK, so that's loading the level and uh, the tile position. Where were we? Then implement spawn player so it correctly uses the configuration specified by the level file so you can start testing collisions. So just like assignment three in scene Zelda.h, what I have given you is um, a player config here. So this player config takes in the x and the y, um, the collision x and collision y. That may have been bx and by in the config file, the speed and the health. And this is the weapon. Um, which is the string of the weapon. And I don't think I've given you an NPC one, but you can make your own NPC one if you want to load the variables for like an NPC AI or something like that. Okay? Um, so I've given you that. And then in the spawn player, what I've given you here is um, some sample code. So what I've done, again, uh, you saw it already is auto p equals m entity manager dot add player. So we are no longer referring to the player as the m underscore player variable. But down here, if I did want to, now I already have this p that I've returned from the, um, the entity manager. So that's how I can refer to the player in this function. But in any other function where I want to get access to the player, let's say I want the uh, transform component of a player, it would be like this, get c transform. So it would be player, that returns the player, then get C transform. So that's how you're using the player everywhere else. And so here what I've done is I've added the transform to just say, okay, the player is at 640 by 480. I've given it the stand down animation, which is repeating. I've given it uh, a bounding box of 48 by 48. It blocks movement, but not vision. And I have given it a health component of seven total health with three current health. Okay, so that's how you do it. And then implement this function so that it uses the parameters that are actually read from the configuration file rather than just my hard coding here. So that's the spawn player function. Um, implement the camera changes described above. So here there is a where are we? camera system. So there is a camera system. Implement the camera logic. So here is the view. 
Um, this view is the current view of the window. If we are following, calculate how to do the view for following Zelda. If we are doing the room-based one, calculate the room-based uh, view for Zelda, or for, for Link, sorry. And then I've already done it for you where I go ahead and set the view. So I've already gotten the view, and I've already set the view. All you have to do now is change it. And if you look, you may say, well, it looks already done for me. Look at that. You've, I mean, it looks like it's correctly placing Zelda. Well, it just so happens that the default view of the SFML window is room 00. Right? But if you move out of this room, the, the default view will not follow you. Right? So implement that first so that you can properly test everything. Then implement spawn sword so that it spawns a sword in the correct position with the correct lifespan. So here there is a spawn sword somewhere. Spawn sword. OK. So it says to do, and, and then it's given an entity. So that entity. You'll, sp you'll be spawning the sword at the position of the player for this assignment, but maybe you want to spawn it at a different entity. Maybe you want the Tektites to have swords or whatever, right, you, for bonus marks. So implement the spawning of the spore, sword, which should be given an appropriate lifespan. So that, I think, in the thing was 10 frames, so a six of the second. Should spawn at the appropriate location based on the player's facing direction. And so in the player, did I actually do that for you? Yeah, so I have a facing here in uh, the player's uh, transform component. So whenever you detect that the player is moving left, you can set facing to negative 1, 0. If the player is moving up, you can set facing to 0, negative 1. If they're facing down, which they are by default, it's 0, 1. And if they're facing to the right, it's 1, 0. So if you have the facing angle, that tells you which direction they're facing. So if you have that, you can just multiply that by a tile, right? So if I'm facing to the right, well, spawn the sword to the right, and then properly orient the sword so it's facing in the right direction. Um, it should be given a damage value of 1, and it should play the slash sound. And again, uh, to play uh, sounds, it's super easy. Over in the game engine class, I have a play sound and a stop sound. So if you just pass in a string, so here, if I want to play the sound, I think the, contact, the syntax is like m game. Um, is that what it is? Yeah, I think it's just m game dot play sound or dot play sound slash. So that's that's like what you have to do. I think that's all that it is. Let me just check to see. Scene contains. Ah, uh, it's a game. It's a pointer. So this would be like this. So I think that's all you do to play sounds. Just just play around with it. It should work. Next, what do we have to do? Uh, implement player attacking and sword collisions with NPCs and their health and their damage. So that's, that's like we've got a component for health. Um, so up here in the components, we've got a damage component. So that will be the damage that it deals. We've got a health component. And the health component has a maximum health and a current health, right? So you know the maximum and the current. So that should, shouldn't be a problem. Implement player animations correctly so that they animate based on the player's state. So properly draw moving to the left, moving to the right, uh, running, etc. And the player's state, that is a convenience component here where you can say, excuse me, if I know that I'm supposed to be moving, then the player is in a moving state or a running state, for example. They may be in an attacking state or a standing state. You, you can use this um, uh, however you wish. Implement NPC patrol behavior. I think patrol behavior is, is probably the easiest. So if we look over here, um, this is the follow behavior. So the follow behavior component just stores the home position and the speed. Right? So when it can see the player, it's moving toward the player at the speed. When it can't see the player, it is moving back to its home position at the speed. The patrol behavior um, has a speed, it has a current position, and a vector of positions. So this is the vector of patrol positions. And what I've put in here for you, current position, that is the index that you are currently heading toward in the patrol positions. So by default, when it starts, you are currently heading toward 
position 0. Um, then when you reach that position, you're going to increment that index. So now you're heading toward positions 1. Once you get to that, increment it so you're heading toward positions 2. And once you get to the last position, which is size minus 1, then you wrap it around back to 0 so that it keeps going around and around and around. So that's what that um, patrol component is. So whenever you're reading in the level file that an MPC has a patrol behavior, then you attach. Well, what you do is read in the vector create, or attach a patrol component, then read in the positions, and as you read in the positions, add them to this part of the patrol component. Uh, implement the NPC behavior without vision. So don't do the vision check. Just make sure that your follow behavior works. Then implement the things for vision that you will need to have vision being correct. So implement physics line intersect, which will allow you to test whether or not two line segments A, B intersect and where they intersect. Then implement uh, physics entity intersect, which will allow you to test whether line segment inter line segment AB intersects with any lines of the bounding box of entity E. And we just looked over those. Um, implement, implement NPC follow behavior using 10, this one, to check line of sight. So go back and add the line of sight check to your actual follow behavior. Then I would implement invincibility frames, then heart tile pickups, and then black tile teleporting. So it seems like there's a ton of stuff in this assignment, but remember, the Entity Manager is done, the VEC2 is done, the physics collisions you have from Assignment 3, and so really like eight of these 14 things you have to do. So none of it is super complex, but there's a good bit of programming, and remember that every character of code that you type for this assignment can go right into your project. Right? So you can take Assignment 4, which has all the stuff that you've programmed so far, and just start the project from Assignment 4 if you want to. Any questions? about the assignment. Any questions about the project? OK, so the due date for the project proposal was on Tuesday, right? So hopefully everyone has submitted that. Um, if you haven't, well, I'm going to check it today. So that's your, that's your final, final due date. Um, I've just been marking exams and stuff for another class, so I haven't gotten to it yet. Um, if you don't hear from me, like if by next, let's say, if by Sunday you don't see an issue in your, okay, never mind. Whether or not I have an issue with your proposal, I'm going to post an issue on your GitHub, right? So I'll, I'll create an issue which says there are no issues, <laughs> just to let you know that I've looked at it. Um, if there are issues like, oh, I think that's a bit too much, I think that's not enough, um, I'm going to create an issue that there are issues. Okay, so that's what I'll do. So I'll just use GitHub for that. I have been spammed on, on Tuesday. I got like 13 GitHub uh, invites, which was pretty fun. I haven't accepted any of them yet, but I will soon. Let me just double check that there is nothing else I want to look at in this class. Oh yeah, there's the pause functionality. It's the same thing as assignment three. In fact, I don't even know why I included that, but just do it. Oh, the marks file, marks file. Got it. Uh, code style modularity readability. I'm probably, I don't know why I have that as 10. That should be like five. Whatever, it's there as 10 now. So the drawing is uh, animations. Um, I've done the rendering for you. I don't think you need to do any of the rendering. You'll figure that out pretty quick as you implement things and the rendering. If the rendering is not done, you have to do the rendering. If it's done, you don't have to do it. Uh, all entities properly read from the level file and drawn in the correct rooms and at the centers of their tiles. Player animations are set properly based on the state. Run animation doesn't play when uh, left and right or up or down are held. Sword animation appears properly in the correct place. And direction 150 milliseconds. That, OK. That should be 10 frames. Uh, that's what I said in the, the text file. Uh, that's, again, just from an old version where we were timing th things with time rather than in frames. Um, this is all the game functionality. I don't need to read all that again. And then the GUI functionality is worth 10. And then up to 10 bonus marks for cool stuff. The TA has sent me a list of um, cool features in games that have been um, been sent in, but lectures have been running to the to the like end of the lectures. So what I'm going to do is, if some lecture 
goes short, I'm going to show like cool things that people have done from all the assignments. But what I used to do because I was doing it online is just take an extra 10 minutes at the end of class to show those, but I don't have that luxury when the, the thing cuts off in the middle. So um, I'll have a look at the schedule, and we'll do that in some lecture. But I will show off the cool bonus stuff that you've done. And the total mark, of course, is 100. And that's it. I don't think you need to look at any of the other files here. Yeah, the only other difference is that um, get component, add component have just become get and add. And in the assets, there is now a get sound. And there is also get animations and get sounds. So if for whatever reason you wanted to do something like in my user interface, implement something where you could test, play, and stop all the sounds, here's where you can get all the sounds. Um, and also for you implementing the animations part of the GUI, here's where you can get all of the animations and their names. All right, that's it for assignment four. Um, I don't know if it'll be fun, but at least uh, I, I had a good time making it, so hopefully you have a, a good time programming it.